Good afternoon and welcome to another session of Ask an Expert. I'm Tom Malero. I'm here with you again this week. We're going to talk about all of our various wood finishes. We have traditional spar varnishes. We have more modern urethane varnishes. We're going to talk about overall wood treatments on how to uh, prep uh, the various forms of, of woods, how to seal them properly, uh, talk about if you could varnish over epoxy, if you could varnish over direct wood, if you would varnish over a sealer, if you would add a performance enhancer to some of our solvent-based varnishes. We're going to talk thinners, we're going to talk safety again, we're going to talk application tools, best practices, uh, you know, your do's and don'ts. Uh, but I'm going to kick it off right now with a giveaway. Uh, if you folks go ahead and either leave me a comment in the uh, comment section or if you email me at marketing at pettitpaint.com. If you want to show some pettit pride around your, your place of business, uh, your vessel, uh, your home, whatever you like, the back of your pickup truck on your, uh, the back window, uh, that's where I have a lot of stickers on my truck. Uh, feel free, again, email us or shoot us a comment uh, in our Facebook live stream. Uh, we'd be happy to get these stickers out to you, no charge. Just send us your address. Don't leave your address in the comment section. That's all I'll say about that. Um, I'm just going to hit refresh here. Uh, I'm operating both the camera and the computer here today. I'm hoping to pay attention to this as much as possible so I can see your questions as they come up. Uh, but let's go ahead and get right into it. Uh, we're going to start off with safety, as I, uh, I typically do here. Um, one thing whenever you're working with varnishes is you always want to make sure you're wearing good gloves. Uh, I prefer uh, nitrile gloves. They stand up really well to solvent. Um, they come in a lot of cool different colors. Uh, you'll see me wear different colored gloves all the time. Uh, but these stand up really well. Uh, they're very puncture resistant. Um, they don't tear easily, especially when you're trying to remove them. Kind of your inexpensive latex gloves, they don't hold up that well. Uh, you can get nitrile gloves with uh, uh, a texture to it, a non-skid finish, so you have really good uh, grip on your tools. So always wear gloves. Uh, always take off your watches. I'm not going to go too crazy here today, so I'm going to leave my watch on. Um, so this covers your hands. Next thing is respiratory, right? Make sure you're taking care of your lungs. You only get two. So uh, always wear a mask whenever you're using a solvent-based varnish um, or wearing a mask when you're sanding. Uh, this is my 3M mask I use all the time. Um, obviously, there's other manufacturers of masks out there. Uh, one tip I will share with you. Uh, now, mind you, I'm not a 3M rep, so I don't know if this is still accurate information, but... Uh, from what I know, these N95 masks and chemical cartridges usually last 15 to 30 days. Uh, and that obviously depends on use, what you're using the product, uh, what product you're using, uh, if you're atomizing those products via uh, spraying or if you're just rolling. Uh, obviously, you're going to put different particulates in the air. So what I always recommend, and this is a good tip, always put your date on your uh, filters and your cartridges. So uh, this is a new cartridge. I put 5.1 for today's date. I also did that for the chemical side of things. Uh, that's just a really good practice. What, Like I said, the old standard was 15 to 30 days. I see a lot of folks using the same mask for, for many years. And this obviously this really doesn't go bad unless you're, um, you know, the pieces inside go bad. But I see a lot of people using these cartridges for months, and that's really not what it's used for. Protect yourself. Make sure you're going by the manufacturer's guidelines for replacing these filters. Uh, it's easy. They just, you know, clip on and off. Now it's fighting me. Well, they just twist on and off. So we covered gloves. We covered uh, your masks. So, again, uh, keep an eye on your filters. Uh, another tool you may need is a razor blade. Uh, Tom, why would you recommend a razor blade? Well, because not everybody's a professional varnisher, right? 
Uh, I'm not going to stand here in front of you and tell you I'm the greatest varnisher in the world. I'm not. Um, but I certainly know how to handle the products. I know how to apply them. I've made all these. Uh, I'm a pretty good um, applicator. But there are folks out there that will make mistakes, right? If you're doing hatchboards from a sailboat and you're doing a flat surface and you're really laying on the varnish really thick, you may have an issue with uh, mud cracking or alligatoring. The only real way to do that or to correct that is to really scrape that area back and rebuild that certain spot. Uh, an easy way to do that is with a flat edge. You could then uh, push the, the razor blade into that alligatoring or that uh, mud cracking area, cut it back, take some solvent, wipe any of the remaining uh, uncured varnish that's in there, and then start building it back up. The reason why it alligatored and why it mud cracked, you overcoated soft varnish too quickly. So basically what happened was the top of the surface skimmed over but had a lot of soft uh, uncured varnish below it, a lot of solvent in there. Solvent on top, you have a film in the middle, solvent on the bottom. The solvent on the top is trying to get through that coating and now you're creating an issue. The two are fighting each other and causing the surface to either mud crack um, or you know, become unsightly. So a razor blade may be needed if you're an amateur or if you make a mistake. Listen, everybody makes a mistake, right? Uh, there's no perfect way how to varnish, right? There's no perfect conditions. We certainly can try to control those conditions, but you know, a lot of times, you know, I, I painted these in my basement, so you're gonna see little imperfections. You're gonna see a little bit of dust. Um, so, I mean, there's just, it's tough to get a perfect uh, environment. So you may need a corrective tool like a razor blade. Uh, in terms of other things you may need, uh, may need for the job, filters. Filters are very important when using varnish. Um, we manufacture a lot of our varnishes in like 100 gallon batches. So it's a big tub. You, all your raw materials get put in, they get mixed together, they get blended and then put into our cans. We, we go through many, many, many different QC checks to make sure that the product stays as clean as it can before it gets to you and when you open it. But what happens is, it may get to you and be 100% clean, no, no environmental particles or anything in there. But if you're not going to use the whole cord up at a time, you pour some varnish into here. The first time you use it, it's clean. If you, if you leave the cap open or, or the lid open, you can get environmental uh, contaminants in here. And if you don't strain the second time around, well, they're just going to go into your varnish and then go onto your, fit, onto your panel, onto your boards, onto your handrails or whatever else you're trying to varnish. So filters are very important. In terms of, um, you know, vehicles or cups that you would use to pour varnish through your strainer into, uh, I prefer plastic containers or I prefer paper cups. Why a paper cup? Well, this is easy. You don't have to clean it up afterwards. Uh, you just throw it away. Just keep in mind, there are a lot of paper, uh, paper cups out there that have a wax coating on the inside. You kind of want to look for an unfinished uh, cup if you're going to use cups. Um, Solvent-based varnishes can cut that wax uh, because they're not really built for varnishes, right? Um, it will cut that wax and you may have some form of streaking issue because then you have the solvent reacting with the wax. So if you use paper cups, Keep mind of the finish on the inside. You want an unfinished uh, cup. Plastic cups are uh, very nice because you don't have any contamination issue, but you do want to clean this. Uh, you know, these can get expensive. These are about 80 to 90 cents a cup. Um, so either clean it up or throw it away, but it gets expensive if you throw these away. Uh, one of the nice things about a plastic cup is uh, obviously, you're not doing a coat of varnish, you're doing four to six coats or a lot of our finishers out there, you know, Reed's Boatworks, Cats Marine on a Pack On, the folks that do really high-end refinishing, you know, they do 10, 12, 14, 16 coats. Uh, they'll build up 10 coats with our flagship high build varnish and then they'll finish it with captain's varnish. So obviously, you may end up using this same cup over and over again. So if you're going to do that, 
make sure you put a cover on top of it. Uh, a lot of the, the cup manufacturers out there have the lids available, so make sure you pick up a few lids. Another helpful, uh, helpful tip there. You're going to need rags. You're always going to need rags. Either rags to uh, soak with varnish, I'm sorry, to soak with thinner. Uh, you know, there's tack cloths to wipe down. Uh, sanding residue in between coats. You could also use a rag with thinners for that same purpose. Uh, in terms of tape, this is a very important thing when we're talking about finishes. Uh, and right here I have two different uh, examples of tape. We have our blue, you know, 2090 3M uh, generic general use painter's tape. This is really good for solvent-based varnishes and solvent-based coatings. Uh, solvent-based coatings don't tend to creep under the finish. Uh, this is also removable after a certain amount of time, usually seven days. Whenever you're using a water-based varnish or you know urethane, you always want to go with a tape built for a acrylic or water-based coating. Why? Water tends to creep under traditional general use tapes. Uh, so like take our seagull for instance. Seagull will absolutely creep under uh, your traditional general use tape. What's nice about something like, and this is fraud tape, uh, but there's obviously different variations of product out there. Um, this works really well because what happens is when that water starts creeping under the tape, it actually mixes with the adhesive and the adhesive actually swells and keeps a very clean line. Um, so, blue regular generic paint, uh, painter's tape, good for solvent-based coatings. Something like a frog tape or tape specifically meant for water-based coatings, you know, you should really use those. Um, so, differences between tapes. Um, so that kind of covers those tools. We're going to talk about application tools now. Right here I have three different uh, brushes and I'll bring these closer to the camera so you can really see the differences between them all. I'm just going to hit a quick refresh here see if uh, any questions are coming up. I'm going to bring these over to the camera. So what we have here, uh, as, I, as I was talking about before, we have three different forms of uh, brushes here. We have a natural bristle brush right here. Um, this is a, uh, they call it a flagship brush. Um, there's a lot of different natural bristle brushes out there. Um, the reason why it's called a natural bristle brush is this is actual animal hair. Uh, this works really well for applying solvent-based coatings. You don't want to use this for water-based coatings. And there's a lot of folks that are tuning in right now going, why, are, why is that such a big deal? Well, a natural bristle brush, because it's animal hair, is actually hollow. So this will actually soak up the resins and the oils and uh, the vehicles within the solvent-based coatings and allow it to spread out nice and even with minimal uh, brush marks and things like that. A synthetic bristle brush, as you see here, uh, it's synthetic because it's non-animal-based. Uh, it's actually a, you know, a synthetic uh, material. This will not absorb anything. This will just uh, bring the water-based coating and spread it uh, around nicely. The reason why you don't use water-based coatings with a natural bristle brush, because they're hollow, it soaks the, it actually takes the water out of the varnish and just leaves vehicle behind. So what you'll find if you use a natural bristle brush with a water-based coating is it will not level nice, it will not spread nice, uh, you'll have a lot of rut, um, you know, streaks in the finish because you've taken all the flowing agent out of the water-based coating. Literally, the only thing you're leaving behind now is resin, and that's not what you want. For a coating to work well, it's got to have the flowing agent and the resins and everything else that goes with it. Synthetic bristle, brush, uh, synthetic bristle brushes work extremely well with water-based coatings. 
So natural bristle brush, solvent-based coating, synthetic bristle brush, water-based coatings, okay? And there's always multiple different versions of both. Uh, what you see on the left-hand side here is the white natural bristle brush is actually a tipping brush. It's actually thinner in terms of the, the amount of uh, bristles that you're seeing. So uh, this wouldn't be used as a uh, application tool. This would actually be used as a tipping brush. You'd apply the varnish, you know, typically with a roller, and then you'd tip it off with this. So I'm gonna hop uh, back behind the table here and talk about that a little bit more. Just check the feed here, see if there's any questions. Uh, so again, application tools are very important and very specific to the varnish that you're using. Ah, Jeff, great question. So uh, why not a foam brush? Jeff, that's next on my list. I'm probably going to upset a lot of you real traditional varnishers right now. Um, <laughs> I say this with hesitation, and um, be careful with the hate mail, uh, but if you want to send it, marketing at pettypaint.com. There is no right or wrong way how to apply varnish, except for when you're applying water-based or solvent-based coatings and using the wrong brush, uh, if you're using a traditional bristle brush. You can absolutely apply varnish with natural bristle brush, synthetic bristle brush, a roller. If you're going to use a roller, I suggest uh, foam rollers. Uh, I call these hot dog rollers. I mentioned these on a couple of Facebook Lives already. Uh, these are really good for applying a very thin and consistent amount of varnish. Uh, what you will find is you may get quite a few air bubbles with this. Now, a lot of folks would say that's a bad thing, and it is. But that's the reason why you don't just roll varnish on and just let it cure. If you're going to roll varnish on, it's a two-part system. It's rolling it on and tipping it. So um, you can roll varnish. You can brush on varnish. There's no wrong way how to do that. The most important thing is uh, applying the finish in thin coats. And you could apply the varnish with, again, natural bristle brush, synthetic bristle brush, or foam brushes. Foam brushes are really nice, uh, and I actually prefer them personally um, because I find it's very hard to load up a foam brush with a ton of material if you're not just dipping the whole brush all the way up to its handle and varnish. If you're just dipping it in, you know, your typical half inch or three, quarter, three quarters of an inch uh, into, your, uh, into your varnish, you're not going to overload this. Uh, it also has a very nice, uh, neat point to it where it's actually very nice. You can actually pull the varnish uh, either away from it or to you. It doesn't really matter. But it really keeps the varnish coat very thin. So you could use any application tool for applying varnish. Uh, so that's, that's the question when it comes to foam brush or foam brushes. Um, Looks like that's about it for questions right now. Uh, let's talk about, uh, we talked about brushes here. So I'll just get these out of the way. I'm gonna keep one of these foam brushes for later because we're gonna show uh, just a quick application here. Um, always, uh, when we're talking about uh, tools, I always recommend the uh, infrared thermometer Anytime before you try working um, in your shop or in your house or in your basement or out in the boatyard, you always want to make sure your substrate temperature, especially when you're dealing with a single component moisture cure product, is it's at least 50 degrees. Okay, so that's very important. Now we're going to talk about the differences between the varnishes here. We're going to start out with what your preparation code is. Uh, this, uh, you know, this got beat up a little bit in transit on the way to my house. Um, so you see there's some, some runs on the can here. But the most important thing whenever you're dealing with raw wood is it has to be sealed. Now, there's a lot of different ways how to do that. You have a lot of folks out there that will take uh, a product like West System or System 3 or, you know, Moss Epoxy. 
you name your favorite uh, epoxy company, it all works. Uh, they may put down two or three coats of epoxy first. Uh, just as a reminder, epoxy has no UV resistance to, to it whatsoever. If you're going to build up with epoxy, it will look nice and smooth and consistent, uh, but do not just expose that to the elements. There's no UV resistance in that. It will yellow, it will, it will um, excuse me, it will yellow, it will discolor. At some point, it may uh, delaminate and come off the coat, off the wood. So you, uh, epoxies are not UV stable. Our system, we always recommend applying at least one very generous coat of Easy Wood Sealer 2018. Now I'm going to come around to the camera here and show you what I started with. Uh, this is a piece of teak uh, I cut down. This was like a six foot board length that I cut down to various sizes. Um, you can see when it's untreated, uh, it was very raw, uh, still pretty tight wood grain overall. Uh, I wouldn't say that this was, uh, you know, weathered or anything. Uh, older, drier piece, but um, certainly not. You know, I've seen some teak handrails that you could, you know, lay a dime in the gaps. Uh, but it's tightly, uh, it's tightly adhered. Um, you know, it's not really weathered. Um, right here, I left this one kind of gnarly because this is going to be my uh, application board. This is sea gold satin on the left. This is the untreated um, easy wood sealer because, again, you always need to seal wood before you try to finish it. And this is the sea gold gloss. So you can see the, the real differences between the two. You know, satin finish and a high gloss finish. Uh, and again, I left it pretty untreated because I'm going to show you how to prep this afterwards. Uh, so first thing is take your block of wood or your piece of wood or your handrail or whatever you're working on. Uh, this is a 240 grit. Again, it depends on the shape of the wood. If it's a very smooth, very tight piece of wood, you'll get away with 220 relatively easily. You can just rub this on the surface, you know, work it back and forth. You'll get to a smooth finish, and you'll start to see it starting to, uh, to cook into the finish here, uh, or into the wood, and start to open it up some. You're going to 240 the entire piece. You're then going to come back. Um, you could do this with a tack cloth, but it's really a waste of a tack cloth at this point. Uh, what I'd recommend is taking the 120 brushing thinner. Take a really uh, clean rag. Wet the rag a little bit. See all the sanding residue? Now you do a little bit and you come back through and you take a, uh, the dry side or the clean side of the rag and you wipe it back over to remove it and then you do it again. You always want to make sure you're flipping your rags or paper towels often because as you can see, the third time wiping it down, you still have contamination coming off on the surface. You still have sanding residue. Uh, if there was oil in this, um, that's a different treatment. We'll talk about that in a second. But sand, solvent wipe, Allow the solvent to flash off completely, and then you can move on to your wood sealer. In regards to easy wood sealer, again, we talked about applying a generous coat of this. This is a very, very, very thin product. Why is it thin? Because we want this to deeply penetrate the surface. So you would then take your, um, I'm not going to apply it here um, because I'm going to show you some varnish there in a second. Um, Apply this very generously. Uh, don't be shy with it. Uh, a lot of the product that's in here, obviously, is a lot of resin, but there's a lot of solvent in here, and that's to deeply penetrate the wood. So, sand, clean, at least one coat of easy wood sealer. If the teak is in really rough shape, you're going to need to come back, scuff it. Uh, you could do either a scotch brite pad or your 240. Uh, again, depends on your wood. Uh, and then apply another generous coat of easy wood seal. What you want to see is there's a little bit of mill thickness just over the wood grain. That's what you're looking for. You want this to deeply penetrate, create a very 
uh, tenacious bond into the wood by really soaking all the wood grain with the um, the solvent and the resin in this coating or in this in this product and really get you a really good base coat okay I will come over here and show you once again so this is raw basically treated with sanding and solvent to remove any residue this strip right here is what it looks like when you have the correct amount of easy wood sealer on here you have just enough of the product coming right over the wood grain. And you can see it has a slight gloss to it. That's the, you know, that's all the good stuff at the, at the surface there, okay? So easy wood sealer. This is what we recommend to seal and deeply penetrate the wood. In terms of varnishes, I have one, two, three, four, five, six different varnishes here. Of the six different varnishes, there's actually one, two, three, four that don't look terribly different from um, the two that start here, but they are a completely different uh, technology. Captain's Varnish and Flagship High Build Varnish, uh, these two guys right here, these are traditional spar varnishes. These other four are urethane varnishes. Now, I get uh, questioned all the time, what is the difference between a spar varnish and a urethane varnish? And um, it's a simple answer. Spar varnishes uh, are more traditional technology. You could apply them. Uh, don't expect to dry in an hour or two. Uh, they're more of an overnight dry. Um, in terms of coating and the technology, when you apply six or eight coats of spar varnish, when it's exposed to UV, what happens is just the outside coating breaks down. The five or six layers below it do not get broken down. In regards to a urethane varnish, these dry faster. You can usually do multiple coats in a day, but the drawback is if you do those same five or six coats, where the spar varnish only breaks down on the top coat, your, your urethane varnishes break down through all coats. So let me reiterate. If you do five or six coats of, of spar varnish, only the outside coating breaks down, making it very repairable. You would literally just scuff off the outside coating that's broken down and reapply. The urethane varnishes, all coats break down. So, a lot of folks, what they'll do is they'll do kind of a pre-treatment or annual refresh of their, of their urethane coatings to prevent that from happening. But if it does happen, you're then stripping all five or six coats and starting over, where with a spar varnish, you're not starting over. You're just refreshing the outside coating. So those are the big differences between a spar varnish and a urethane varnish. Okay. One of the questions here is, will denatured alcohol work? Uh, Jeff, need more specifics. Will it work for thinning the product or cleaning um, the wood? Um, you cannot thin these with the denatured alcohol. It doesn't work. You can clean the wood with denatured alcohol if you want. The issue is, denatured alcohol evaporates extremely fast. Denatured alcohol, by the time you wipe it on here, by the time you come back to rewipe it to remove the rest of the residue, it's most likely gone. So denatured alcohol is not really the best product for doing that. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, so that was, that's the high level look at the differences between spar varnish and urethane varnish. Let's talk about the differences between the varnishes themselves. I'm going to start out with Captain's Varnish right here. Now, just so you guys know, the audience knows, all these uh, panels right here have been treated the same. They were sanded, solvent wiped, one coat of Easy Wood Sealer, and then four coats of the product, if it's flagship or Captain's or Ultra Clear or whatever. So they were all treated the same. The differences that you'll see um, and starting off with 1015 Captain's Varnish, 
1015 Captain's Varnish is the industry's number one selling varnish. It has been for many years, and there's many reasons for that. It lays out super smooth. You can apply it in cold temperature, you can apply it in hot temperature, you don't have any real fluctuation in its application. It's very consistent, it's very reliable. If you use Captain's Varnish 20 years ago and use Captain's Varnish today, the products are identical. The formula doesn't change, um, it's very consistent and it works extremely well. Has a very good UV um, package to it, lots of UV filters in it. I recommend Captain's Varnish for everybody. I especially recommend Captain's Varnish when you're an amateur applicator, meaning this isn't something you do on a regular basis. Captain's Varnish is extremely forgiving. Wonderful for both interior and exterior use. Obviously, if you're using it on the interior, it is solvent-based. You want to be careful, always wear protective equipment, but very easy to use, uh, very forgiving, uh, industry best for forever. Let me check here, let me see if uh, any other questions. In regards to 2015 flagship high build varnish. Now, we discontinued our high build varnish this year. Uh, high build varnish was around for 20 years. It had different labels on it. It was easy poxy high build varnish. It was then pettit high build varnish. I'm going to let you guys in on a little secret. High build varnish has always been the same product as flagship. Um, to give you a little peek behind the curtain, you know, one of our uh, favorite retailers came to us and said we would really like to have something that says high build varnish on it. And we, for a very long time, said, well, Flagship is that product, but they really wanted a, a label that said High Build Varnish. So if you're used to using 2056 High Build Varnish, it is 100% identical in every way, shape, and form to Flagship High Build Varnish. We added High Build to the label of Flagship this year to help those folks make the tra transition. Flagship has always been a High Build Varnish. Um, so let's talk about the difference between Captain's and Flagship. Flagship has a much higher solids content, meaning it builds much faster than Captain's varnish. If we were to take a took, you know, dry film thickness test here, in the same four coats that we applied the Captain's varnish and the Flagship varnish, there will be about two times the amount of mill thickness on the flagship panel than the captain's panel. It's tough to see, especially on Facebook Live. Facebook Live tends to dumb down these presentations to, you know, 360 or 720. So it's, it's tough, it's really, especially more tough on Facebook Live. But flagship builds twice as fast as captain's varnish. Flagship also has six times UV inhibitors or UV filters that captain's does. Why is that important? If you're tuning in in Florida, flagship high build varnish will last a lot longer than captain's varnish at the same amount of coats because you have twice the amount of, or you have six times UV filters and twice the amount of mill thickness. Okay, Tom, you've been saying really great things about flagship. What's the drawback? The drawback is if you're an amateur applicator, because this is much thicker, you'll have a tendency to over-apply it. Why is that a problem? Well, I was talking about how some of us aren't perfect applicators or we're not perfect um, varnishers. When you over-apply the varnish, you could obviously have a run. But what happens more times than not is that mud cracking or uh, alligator issue I was talking about before. If you have a heavy hand and you apply flagship, and you just pay attention to the dry tailings on the back of the can, and you come back overnight, and you apply flagship twice as, as thick as it's supposed to be per the manufacturer's directions, and you apply another coating that's equally as thick, you're going to have that same solvent entrapment issue that we talked about earlier, where it's going to mud crack and alligator. So, flagship varnish, really great for the professional applicator. Good for the amateur who doesn't have a heavy hand. 
Um, so just keep those two things in mind. Captain's varnish will make anyone look like a pro. Flagship varnish, you got to be a little bit more careful with it. Um, but the reason to use it or the advantages to use it are all there. Builds faster, means less coats, better UV package, better from coast to coast. So those are the differences between captain's varnish and flagship varnish. These are our spar varnishes, traditional spar varnishes. Now I'm going to spend some time here and talk about our urethane varnishes. Um, one of my favorite pettit products, uh, and I, I say this to my colleagues all the time, you know, what you, they always ask me, what's your two favorite products? I say Rustlock and Captain's uh, uh, Satin Sheen Varnish. So I do a lot with custom uh, furniture. Um, I've been known to build, you know, dressers and TV stands and uh, you name it, I've probably done it. Um, as you can see with the satin sheen, which is different from Captain's, um, is the finish. Satin sheen has a bit of a satin finish to it, but not a gloss finish. Unlike the Captain's, that is a very high gloss, very reflective finish. Why would someone want to use a satin finish instead of a hot, instead of a gloss finish? Well, a few reasons. This product in particular is for interior, interior use only. You do not want to use Captain's Satin Sheen Varnish on the exterior of a boat. This doesn't have any UV protection in it, okay? So don't use this on the exterior of the boat. Why a lot of folks use a satin uh, varnish is, well, if you're painting floorboards inside the boat, if you're painting cabinets within the boat, if you're painting or varnishing uh, any type of inter interior finish in the boat, the satin finish doesn't have a glare that comes off it. Uh, it always looks clean. Uh, sometimes the wood on the inside of the boat could be beat up over the years from tackle and things like that. And a satin, uh, satin finish hides a lot of sins. This could be a really gnarly, really beat up piece of wood and you put a satin finish on there and it hides all those sins. So satin sheen varnish, again, I use it a lot for furniture making. Uh, it gets used all the time for interiors. It holds up really well to chemicals. It holds up really well to foot traffic. So this is the preferred finish for high, you know, high traffic areas, okay? So that's the satin sheen varnish. We offer a urethane and a high gloss varnish. Both satin sheen and Captain's Ultra Clear are solvent-based urethane uh, products. So just like Flagship and Captain's, they both are solvent-based. This is solvent-based as well, but urethane technology. This will dry quickly, it will build quickly. This will um, have a similar smell to the other products, but this will dry faster than a spar varnish. Again, drawbacks of urethanes, this will break down through all layers where a spar varnish will only break down on the out outermost layer. Uh, this is a very forgiving product. Um, it's actually a very cool product for a couple reasons. Um, this product here actually, when you open the can, it's actually, it's purple. And what we do there is we have a, uh, it's like a cobalt type of additive we put in there. And the reason why, if you're using a completely clear varnish like this, in a high gloss situation, you actually might lose where you've been if you're not sanding in between coats. Now I'm gonna talk about that specifically here shortly because you can get away with not sanding in between coats. So um, there is a purple pigment in this and if you open the can, uh, which I will here, And it might be easier on the lid to see here. You can actually see it's, it's got a purple hue to it. Uh, you can see it especially here in the lid. Uh, I was using this uh, this morning. So um, that's a very cool thing. Uh, and as you can see, it obviously doesn't dry with that purple hue to it. 
uh, that's really just to aid the applicator um, in keeping track of where they are, where they've been. Uh, so that's a really unique thing that we do that I don't know anybody else that actually does that. So very cool product, uh, very different from a uh, traditional clear type of, uh, type of varnish. Here, refresh the uh, feed there, see if any questions came up. Uh, cleaning the sawdust off a of piece yet, Jeff? Uh, again, uh, that the nature of alcohol is fine for that, but it's not good for removing any types of oils or really treating the the area well. Okay, it doesn't look like anything else right now. So let's talk about our last one here, or last two. Um, I refer to them as one because it's the same name. Uh, it's called Sea Gold. Uh, sea Gold comes in two variations. It comes in a satin, um, similar to our satin sheen varnish, and also comes in a gloss, as you can see here. Uh, 2045, 2040 are the par are product numbers. This is a water-based coating, meaning you can apply it inside, uh, it doesn't have a really aggressive smell to it. But what's unique about these products as well is there's actually UV protectant in both the satin and the gloss, which is unusual for uh, most satin finishes. One thing I will absolutely stress is whenever you're using a water-based finish, especially something like Seagold, the volume of solids within are much, much, much less than a solvent-based coating. Just water-based coatings have a hard time holding solids. Now, why is that important? Well, because when you're looking at four coats of Captain's or four coats of flagship, all the wood grain goes away. You've got really great mill thickness. Well, as you can see here, the same four coats, you still have all the wood grain. It's gonna take you probably twice as many coats to make it look as clean and as polished as a traditional solvent base that can hold a lot more solids. So occasionally we get a call, you know, Oh, I put on three coats of, of your sea gold, and it doesn't really look that great after a short period of time. A lot of times, those the same three coats that you're used to applying, you're not really coating or adding enough mill thickness to the to the wood to really give you the protection that you're looking for. So, whenever you're using a water-based coating, you almost have to do twice as many coats. Okay, and again, both these are water-based, clean up with soap and water, no solvent smell. You can apply them indoors or outdoors, um, uh, interior or exterior. So that's, that's our seagull. So two spar varnishes, four urethane varnishes, and the differences between. Now, I'm going to uh, pour out a little bit of captain's varnish here into uh, a filter, and then I'm going to add some easy epoxy performance enhancer to it. Now, Easy epoxy performance enhancer, you're going, Tom, what are you doing? You're going to add a product to your varnishes? And absolutely. So you do not have to. Let me clarify. All these products and all these panels were applied without using any of the enhancer. Okay? This is just straight varnish. Um, nothing added to it. No thinner added to it. Um... But what's really nice about our varnishes and our topside paints is we specially formulated an additive called Easy Epoxy Performance Enhancer that can be added to our solvent-based varnishes and topside finishes. You cannot add it to Seagold. Water-based, you cannot add this. This is a solvent-based uh, additive. How this works, um, and it's not like a traditional epoxy where it's going to, you know, kick off a, a chemical reaction. It's an enhancer. It helps the product cure faster. It helps it cure throughout. It helps it give it a better gloss, a better scratch resistance. Uh, you can apply more coats faster because it aids in the cure. You're no longer just relying on a moisture cure. You're actually helping it with its... Um, with, with its through cure. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to crack, crack open some Captain's Varnish here. 
I like to call it liquid gold. Uh, one thing that you'll find about pettit varnishes is you may come across this filter, or I'm sorry, this, um, I guess you'd just call it an O-ring. Uh, this O-ring or sealing ring, um, we especially have placed on top of the lids of our, or the cans. And this is to help keep air out, you know, the six months or whatever it might sit on the shelf. So whatever you're varnishing, the first thing I do is just throw this away. If not, you know, if you keep messing around with it, it might get in there, or it might fall out, but that's a very unique thing that we do that a lot of people don't. That's a, that's a really cool added value that we have to our cans to keep air out. So I'm going to pour a little bit of this into the can here or into my, into my cup. I'm going to do like, I don't know, three ounces um, just for the sake of this demo. Uh, obviously these panels don't take three ounces, uh, but I'm just going to do it here just for show. Okay. Uh, whenever you're just pouring out, I do a pretty good job. I don't get it on the label, but if you do get it on the label, just do a wipe off. That way you can just keep track of, uh, you know, make sure you don't lose your dry times or anything that may be important on the back. Uh, whenever you're sealing up varnish, it's very important. Come back through, clean out the lid. You get some on the label, just wipe it off nice. Put your lid back on. Don't just leave the, the lid of the varnish off. Um, you know, even if you're coming back to the product shortly, always put the lid back on because you don't want to get environmental, you know, dusts and things in there. Always put your lid back on. Uh, for the sake of the camera, I'm not going to hit this with a hammer right now. Um, so always, always, always strain varnishes. If there's air bubbles in there, if you shook it, if uh, there's contaminants in the can because you opened it over and over again, always, always, always strain it. Um, we offer strainers. Your retailers offer strainers. Big box stores have strainers. Always strain varnish. So in regards to Captain, I'm sorry, in regards to Easy Epoxy Performance Enhancer, when you open it up, it has this nice little sealing ring in here. You just pop that open, throw that away. Not that you have to, but you know, anytime you're using a, a, any type of chemical or anything, I always recommend making sure you shake it or, you know, you obviously can't put a, a paint stick in here. But this is a very thin, clear chemical. So it's not gonna throw off any of your finishes. But in terms of a mixing ratio, this whole half pint will do a gallon of varnish or topside paint like Easy Poxy or Easy Dex, uh, Easy Prime, you can add it to your primers. Um, a, for a quart of product, it's six capfuls. So if you just take a capful of this product six times, um, you know, I did three ounces, um, I'm sorry, five ounces. Um, so it's a capful to five ounces. And again, because you're straining the varnish, you should strain the, the performance enhancer. You just pour it in there just like that. Come back through, clean out your cap. Now, a lot of people don't do that, but I'm just, you know, I'm one of those guys. I, I like to keep everything neat and, neat and tidy. Clean off the cap, put the cap back on, and this will not go bad on you. Um, it's airtight with this cap. So you're good to go. You can then throw away your filter, and then you're gonna go ahead and you're gonna mix the enhancer into the varnish. Um, unlike an epoxy, you know, usually when you mix a, uh, a catalyst or a cure with an, uh, with an epoxy base, there's a induction period. This isn't trying to make a chemical bond or chemical reaction. You're not trying to link the polymers or anything. So there's no induction time, okay? Uh, that's a very important thing. So you don't have to just, you know, 
wait 20 minutes to apply this. You do want to make sure it is completely mixed in. And that looks really good. Now again, you know, a lot of you may be thinking right now he's not wearing a mask. It's only five ounces of product. I'm doing a very small board. Um, and I'm going to put the cap on this as, as quick as possible. What I'm going to do, and this is the reason why I'm demonstrating this, is this is very unique to Pettit products only. I haven't seen any other manufacturer do this. And that is, I'm going to put a solvent-based varnish over top of a water-based. So I'm going to take our um, Captain's Ultra Clear, I'm sorry, the Seagold, Seagold Gloss. I'm going to scuff this really quick, and I'm going to put the um, Captain's Varnish on top of it. So again, you know, you could do 240, but... I'm going to be honest with you guys, I, I put the last coat of this on last night, so it's still pretty, it's, it's still pretty tender in the grand scheme of things. So you could just take a scotch spray pad and just dull it down, take that gloss off. Okay, as you see there, it took the gloss right off. You always want to come back through and use a tack cloth or our solvent and a rag. Okay, just like that. I made a dusty area there, so you want to avoid that. I'm going to come through. And again, just for the sake of this demo, I'm going to use a foam brush. No sense in using like a nice eight or nine dollar brush to, to do a little sample like this. But what you want to do is what did we talked about before. I had a tape line there before. That was with the green tape because the, these are water based finishes. I'm now doing a solvent based finish. So, what am I going to do? I'm going to use the blue tape because the blue tape's for solvent based finishes. I'm going to follow the same line I had in here before. Just like so. And then I'm going to take my brush, just making sure the Easy Poxy Performance Enhancer is fully mixed in. Get rid of that. Again, Whenever you're using a foam brush, you only need to, to get enough of the, the brush wet enough that you're, you know, it's a half inch or three quarters of the brush. And then in very thin coats, you work the product in. Uh, whenever you're varnishing, you want to make sure you're going with the wood grain. You don't want to be going against the wood grain. Some folks will go ahead and when they're applying varnish, um, they'll, they'll pour the varnish onto the, onto the substrate. You can absolutely do that. Again, you know, a lot of folks are going to, you know, question that. Again, there's no right or what wrong way to, to do this. Uh, the only drawback of pouring a varnish onto a surface is uh, the potential for over applying. But if you're going to pour the varnish onto the surface, and then do a really good job squeegeeing it down uh, or pulling the, um, pulling the varnish down so it's a thin coat, then you're not really doing anything wrong. You're not over applying the product. So there's that. So apply the varnish in very thin coats. I applied Captain's 1015 over our Seagull varnish just to show you that can happen. Uh, there's no issues with doing that. They are co uh, compatible and interchangeable. I've never seen a, someone want to switch away from Captain's. Uh, and I'm not saying that folks would want to switch away from, from Seagull, but if you're finding, if you get three or four coats into your Seagull job and you're not getting the build or the mill thickness you're looking for, go ahead and, and build up with a couple coats of uh, the traditional solvent-based spar varnishes or... Uh, you know, the, the solvent-based uh, urethane varnishes, because they, they will build faster 
uh, than the water-based coatings. So there's a, just a little demo there. Uh, in terms of uh, other tips and, trips, uh, tips and tricks I could give you, these are all unstained teak. Some cases, or many cases, folks want to stain prior to varnishing. And you can absolutely do that. Pennant doesn't offer a stain anymore. We used to offer multiple stains, but we kind of got out of that business. If you're using one of our solvent-based coatings, try to find a solvent-based stain. There's plenty out there. There's tons of manufacturers. So just find a solvent-based stain. If you're using a water-based coating, try to go with a water-based stain. That way you have best adhesion overall. Now, you can apply a water-based coating over a solvent-based stain, no problem. Um, you just want to be careful putting a solvent-based coating over a water-based stain that's not a pettit product because those other products are really non-commercial, non-marine grade, and those water-based stains will be challenged by the solvent-based top coat. So water-based coating, water-based um, stain, solvent-based coating, solvent-based stain, okay? One other thing uh, I, I lightly mentioned before. Folks all the time want to varnish over epoxy. Can you do it? Are there do's and don'ts? Yes. You can absolutely varnish over epoxy. Uh, there's multiple epoxy manufacturers out there. There's poly, there's regular, you know, everyday epoxy. The biggest thing when it comes to epoxies, if you're going to varnish them, is removing the amine blush. Sure. There are some manufacturers that, out there that say they have a non-blushing epoxy. Great. Don't take the chance and believe them. Uh, it's non-blushing if you don't over-catalyze it, if you don't under uh, if you, if you under-catalyze it, etc. Basically, perfect conditions will mean it didn't blush. But if you over-catalyze or under-catalyze, you're going to have some form of blush happening. It's just, it's a reaction of the amines in the epoxy. Um, so, removing the amine blush is super important. Ammonium water and a Scotch-Brite, or our 92 Bio Blue and a Scotch-Brite. When you're varnishing, you're most likely not going to want to use our Bio Blue, because Bio Blue may leave a lot of contamination behind, uh, may be more difficult to remove. Um, you know, our Bio Blue works really great if you're doing a keel repair with epoxy because then you could do the 92 Bio Blue and hose it off and then sand it and then paint it. Where with varnish, you're not going to, you know, you may not have the best conditions to, to do those extra measures of cleaning. So, ammonium water works really well for removing the amine blush. Then you sand it. Sand it with, you know, depending on the surface, right? If it's really rough, you're going to have to go down to 120. If it's really smooth, 240. Then come back and do the ammonium water wipe again. That will remove the sanding residue, that will remove the uh, amine blush that may have been opened up by your sand. Do yourself a favor, after that, if you're using any of these varnishes, use your brushing thinner to make sure that any type of contamination that may be on the surface has been wiped off. Clean rags, 120 brushing thinner. You can then move right into applying our varnish. There's no intermediate coat uh, needed. You can use our urethane, you can use our spar varnish. Sand, okay, well, let's step back. Remove the amine blush, sand, remove contamination, and then apply varnish. Uh, a lot of folks, if you're fixing a crack or something, in a, or a separation, or if you're trying to bond two pieces of wood together, um, and you're not using one of the big major brands of epoxy and you're using something like Pettit Flex Poxy, a really unique thing about this is you can actually add some of your solvent-based stain to the epoxy as you're mixing it up to get to your finished color faster. So that's a really unique thing about Flex Poxy. Again, you can add your solvent-based uh, uh, stain to Flex Poxy and apply it. So, that's a, it gets done all the time. It's just a tip for some of you that haven't thought about it. And then the same thing. Not that this produces an amine blush, but you still want to sand it and clean it. Okay? So 
You could varnish over epoxy, no problem. Let's talk about sanding, and then it looks like we're getting close on time, so we'll start to, we'll start to wrap this up. We get questions all the time, do I need to sand it between coats? And believe it or not, that's a more complicated question uh, than the sounds of it. You do not need to sand in between coats before 24 hours to gain adhesion. There's enough solvent in any of our solvent-based coatings to bite back into that coating within 24 hours. So from an adhesion standpoint, you don't need to sand within 24 hours. But what's the real reason behind sanding when you're applying varnish? The real reason is, again, none of us are perfect and none of us work in a perfect environment. If you get a bristle hair that came off into the finish, again, I did these in my basement, I could see dust in the finish. Um, you know, you name it, if there's a, if there's a inconsistency or, um, you know, something in the finish, the reason behind the sanding is to take that imperfection out and not keep making the imperfection worse. If you have an imperfection on coat one, by coat six, if you left it in there, it's no longer a little imperfection, it's now a big imperfection because now you have six coats of finish on it now just making it bigger and wider and, you know, uglier. So, before 24 hours, you do not need to sand between coats. After 24 hours, you need to sand between coats to gain adhesion. If you, your varnish has imperfections in it, sand it. Take those imperfections out. Okay, that, that should cover sanding. Um, we have various resources available. If you go on our website, petapaint.com, we actually have this brochure in a PDF. This is kind of do's and don'ts of varnishing. There's frequently asked questions. There's everything I talked about today, but in a more technical uh, presentation. This talks about uh, more, this talks more about sealing. It talks more about added stains or overcoating stains. It talks about sanding between coats. Uh, there's some examples of some of our finishes by some of our customers. So this material is on our website, petapaint.com. Also has this really helpful chart on the back that also helps break down the different varnishes if I didn't do a great job of that. Uh, so this is very helpful in terms of a tool for you. It tells you the breakdowns of our varnishes. It tells you a breakdown of the applications. So that's a very useful tool. That's under the technical bulletins portion of our website and also on our varnishes, uh, varnish pages. Let's talk about thinners here for a second. 120 brushing thinner is used in 80% of our coatings, if not 90% of our coatings. This is a blend of different solvents. It has naphtha, xylene, toluene, uh, and mineral spirits. Why do we suggest or insist on our varnishes and our blends? It's a, it's, a, it's a question we get asked every time. We always get asked for what's the generic thinner. The problem with generic thinners is they're purpose-based. Mineral spirits on its own will absolutely cut captain's varnish. But just adding mineral spirits to captain's varnish will slow down its cure. So the big issue you have with varnishes is the longer they're open, the more contamination gets in the surface. If you're doing something small like this, a tip for that is take a box, flip it upside down, cut a flap off, and when you get done putting the coat of varnish on there, Slide it in inside that open box. It'll prevent the environmental dust from coming down and sticking into your finish. The reason why we use a blend of thinners is so you do not give up certain attributes of the coating. If we were just to put mineral spirits in here, it would stay open a lot longer. It would thin the product, which is what you're looking for, but it'd stay open a lot longer and then add more issues to the open finish. We add xylene to it, so the mineral spirits will cut it, the xylene will make it kick over faster. It will make the, the solvents within the finish flash faster. So that's why we use a blend in our 120 brushing thinner, and that's why we recommend our 120 brushing thinner for many of our products, instead of just a generic thinner. 
There are other manufacturers out there that just put generic thinners in. Um, they're out there. All of ours are blends. Uh, our 121 spraying thinner, so 120 brushing thinner is great for rolling and tipping, not good for spraying. It stays open too long, it will run. 121 spraying thinner is a mixture of xylene and ethyl benzene and a couple other uh, solvents. Why? Because this, this will cure and dry faster, it'll make the, the finish flash, flash faster, that way you don't have runs. That way you don't have contamination opening um, or getting into your finish as it's staying open longer. This is a much faster flashing thinner. You do not want to brush and roll with this because it will actually evaporate fast that you may end up and make it tacky as you're applying it. So when you're rolling and tipping, use brushing thinner. When you're spraying, use spraying thinner. Never do more than like 10% of the brushing thinner the spraying thinner, you can do 10, 15, 20%, depending on the application, right? If you're doing just boards on a, on a horizontal, no problem. You can lay it on a bit thicker. If you're doing something on a vertical, obviously, you don't want to apply it as thick. So that goes over our thinners. Um, in terms of if you don't want to use a varnish, if you want to paint over teak, we're seeing this done a lot. A lot of folks, uh, you know, I use the hashtag all the time, protect your passion. Boating's a passion. There's nothing that's more of a testament of that than varnishing. You have to be extremely passionate about your woodwork, about your vessel, about your boat, to go through the, um, the intricacies of varnishing. Listen, guys, it's a lot of labor, right? If you want your varnish to look like a mirror, if you want it to look super smooth and beautiful, well, then it's a passion. Some folks don't have that passion. Listen, we're, we're a big company, right? We, we, we want to cater to everybody. Folks that want to paint their teak, there's two things here. If it's been previously oiled, that's an issue. If you're using oil on your teak for years, you just have to use tons and tons and tons of 120 brushing thinner and tons of clean rags. Basically, soak the rag, let it sit on the top of the, the teak, and let it try to soak out some of those oils. Works well, it's not a perfect solution. If you've been using teak oil for 20 years, I can tell you, it's really not a good candidate for varnish. You're gonna drive yourself nuts trying to pull that oil out of the finish. If you use oil for a short period of time, well, go that, go that route. Lots of solvent, lots of clean rags, tons of wiping, try to get that oil out of the finish. If it's not been previously oiled, if it's just been, you know, previously sanded or, or clean, like this here, you can then go ahead and seal it with easy wood sealer. So apply the easy wood sealer to your teak. Let it cure. If you have a bit of a mill thickness on top, great. Give a little scuff sand to give you some adhesion, solvent wipe, and then apply easy epoxy. Uh, easy epoxy, easy decks, any of our uh, enamel, I'm sorry, any of our uh, urethane topside paints, you can apply on teak as long as it's properly sealed. So seal it with the uh, 2018 Easy Wood Sealer, and then go ahead and apply the Easy Epoxy or Easy Decks or whatever uh, types of um, uh, type of paint you want to use. Let's see if there's any questions. Yeah, if teak was previously oiled, uh, you, is there a way to remove the teak oil? I was just talking about that. There's really, again, lots of solvent, lots of rags. Uh, in regards to the All Spar product, uh, Dave, I'm gonna be 100% familiar with you. I've never heard of it. What I will do is I will message you directly from our Facebook page after I do a little bit of research and listen, I'm the most honest person that, that there is. If we have an alternative, I'll give it to you. If I don't have an alternative, I'll tell you, you know, we don't have it. Uh, this would be a similar technology or whatever. So, uh, Dave, keep an eye out uh, at your private messages here shortly. I'll reach out to you with an answer. Uh, or I may respond to you in the comments. It depends on the information I find, but I'm unfamiliar with that finish. Um, again, I started this off with... If you're interested in a sticker, 
Uh, if you want to show your Pettit pride, shoot us an email with your address at marketing at pettitpaint.com or pr uh, private message us through Facebook. I will be posting this up on YouTube. Just give me a little bit. I tend to do that late afternoon when I get caught up from uh, the questions and answers. Um, it, I get really great feedback and I'd like to give everybody a very detailed answer if I couldn't do it through Facebook Live here. But I think that really gives you a good overall look into the differences between our varnishes, the way how to treat wood, the different application tools for the varnishes and the sealers, uh, a little uh, look into our Easy Epoxy Performance Enhancer. Uh, one thing I may not have shared a lot of um, information on is, you know, the why. Again, if you're going to use Easy Epoxy Performance Enhancer in our finishes, especially in our varnishes, it makes them cure faster, um, doesn't affect flexibility at all. That's very important when it comes to wood finishes. There's always that flexibility. You don't want it to become brittle. There are two-part wood finishes out there. Uh, I'm not going to name names, but they're extremely brittle. If something knocks into it, you have a chip, it's a very difficult repair. If moisture gets below those two-part finishes, uh, it lifts. Uh, if the moisture content in that piece of wood prior to applying that two-part finish is high, you're going to have a compatibility or an application issue. This is an enhancer. It just enhances the finish, makes it glossier, more scratch resistant, more durable, and also helps it cure faster. So you can do multiple coats in a day. I'm not saying you're ever going to be able to do three coats of varnish of the traditional varnish in a day, uh, traditional spar varnish, but you can absolutely get up to two coats if you're doing it right and you're doing it well, uh, but helps it through cure. So easy epoxy performance and answer. You can apply it or add it to our solvent-based varnishes or our solvent-based topside finishes. Um, and that's going to wrap it up for me. Um, I appreciate you guys tuning in as always. Any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments. Any other questions, please feel free to reach out to us, marketing at pettitpaint.com. If you'd like a sticker to show off your Pettit Pride on your, your truck, your car, your boat, your house, your garage, uh, your, your boat yard, reach out to us. Uh, we're always here as a resource. Stay healthy. And I won't be here next week. I'm going to take a week off. Uh, but I'll be back in two weeks, and we'll go through some more demos. Stay well, stay healthy, we'll see you soon.